and there we go. Hello, good evening, one more time. So we're gonna to talk today about structural properties of networks. It's a sixth lecture of our course. So far, we talked um, about statistical properties of the networks. So we talked about average node degree, about degree distribution, about clustering, path length. So we learn how to characterize networks from that statistical perspectives. We also discussed uh, various local properties of properties per vertex, uh, things like node centrality metrics. We uh, calculated page rank. Um, so we know how to rank nodes in the, in the network. Today, we're gonna to look into pairwise properties. So the notion of having two nodes and trying to understand what makes them similar in terms of the network, right? And also try to see if there's any correlation in between um, the node, if that correlation exists and how it affects the network and how you can measure it. So we'll start with several definitions. So structural, uh, structural equivalence, what it is. Well, two vertices are called structurally equivalent if their respective sets of in and out neighbors are the same, right? So like in plain English, it really means that uh, two nodes are equivalent if they're connected to exactly the same nodes, right? In this sense, if you try to interpret this, for, for example, for social network, for friendship, you know, those two guys, those two people that we're considering and we call them equivalent, if um, they have exactly the same set of friends, right? Now, if you look at the, um, at, at the picture, um, at this graph, you realize that um, there are some nodes that are obviously equivalent here, right? We can look at this node U1 and node U2. Um, this is a directed graph. So U1 is connected to V1 and V2, and the same is U2, right? So they are, Connectivity pattern is exactly the same, right? Now, in terms of the matrices, obviously that means the rows and the columns, right? There's no incoming are the same, okay? So that's called structural equivalence. So again, know the structural equivalent if um, their connect connectivity, connectivity is completely uh, sort of overlapping. Now, um, this is a convenient definition, but unfortunately, it, it breaks down for the nodes that are directly connected to the neighbors. If you look at these two nodes, V1 and V2, um, in fact, um, you know, the, the incoming links, they're all the same, outgoing links are all the same, except for V1 connected to V2 and V2 connected to V1. And so, for example, if we look at, if we look at the, at, at, at the, um, columns, you realize that um, here there is zero while here there is one and here there is one while here there is zero, which is, you know, because they're connected to each other. So in order for this type of definition, for this definition of equivalence work, you might want to actually, for example, add self loops. And then of course you will have ones here and there and everything works just fine, right? So, um, if you want to look for structural equivalence in between nodes that are connected to each other, you need to add to them self loops. Um, here are a few more examples. But, oh, and by the way, if you don't have loops and you just look at the nodes without self loops, um, this is sometimes called strong structural equivalence. So if you look at this slide, you realize that, um, you know, for example, of course, See, so these nodes are all structurally equivalent, right? They have the same um, node they're connected to. Or for example, these two nodes are structurally equivalent because they have exactly the same connecting connection pattern. Or you know, these three nodes are structurally equivalent. Or in this picture, which nodes are structurally equivalent on this picture on the last one? like all of them, right? Because um, this is a complete graph. So every, every node has, is connected to every other node, right? And so for this guy, it has exactly, it 
that's connected to the same nodes as the other guy and they're directly connected, right? So um, they're structurally equivalent. And so when you have a complete graph, all the nodes are structurally equivalent. Does this make sense? Yes, yes. All right. Sorry, I need to let latecomers to come in. Um, now, um, though the definition is uh, structural equivalence is very clear and concise, um, sometimes it's not very useful because in, in, in many real life situations, what you have is um, scenario situations like this. Um, for example, we can look at the node 26 and node 29, and um, you realize, well, I have this node in common, this node in common, this one, this, this, but then 29 is also connected right there, and 26 is also connected right there. So according to the definition, they're not structurally equivalent because of those two connections. But, um, you know, it's kind of, they look quite similar in terms of their role and their position within the network. And you can also, you know, also think about sort of other nodes um, with, with a similar story. Um, then uh, what it would make sense is instead of just introducing this strict definition of structural equivalence, um, talk about node similarity. Node similarity based on the overlap. And uh, when the overlap of the neighbors of the node is complete, then um, those two nodes are uh, equivalent, right? Or similarity will be equal to one. And if it's not complete, um, there is some sort of fraction, then you can actually calculate that fraction and define similarity based on that fraction. So let's see um, what kind of metrics we could introduce. So the first one and the sort of the easiest, the standard metric would be Jacquard similarity, where for two nodes, I and J, we look at the neighborhood of those nodes and then um, we look at the intersection and uh, uh, union of the neighbors. And then the ratio gives us the similarity, right? So for example, in the previous slide, um, there was a union was I believe five nodes. Um, I'm sorry, the union was seven nodes and, and the, um, uh, the intersection was uh, five. So it's five, five, seven. Um, you can also think of a cosine similarity and this cosine similarity based on the idea that um, the, the, you know, you're, you can think about the node as a vector in an n-dimensional space, right? Because we have adjacency matrix. And so um, every node, the neighbors are represented as a vector the way we saw it on a previous, on a normal slide number one. And so then you can actually just iterate on those vectors and find you know, the dot product, the scalar product and that will define a cosine similarity in that space. Or we can actually just do brute force Pearson correlation coefficient, um, also looking onto the overlap um, of, of the uh, connections. So these are similarity measures for the nodes, right? And again, we're talking now, we're not looking at the content of the node, we're just looking at the structure. So it's structure, it's similarity, it's a structural similarity measures. Now, if um, the, the graph is, um, is, if the graph is undirected and uh, we get a binary matrix of only zeros and ones, then um, you can calculate this um, and, and you'll get uh, you know, node degree and number of shared neighbors as a sum. And then um, the metric for cosine similarity will be much easier, right? It's, um, it can be simplified to just number of overlapping of, of common uh, nodes divided by the sum of the node degrees for each of them. And the same way for Pearson correlation. So based on that, we can actually build a node similarity matrix. Now, this is not a, a, an adjacency matrix, right? Adjacency matrix is really has, um, it's, it's usually a binary and has zeros and ones for the connectivity. Here, 
it is similarity of the nodes that are encoded into the elements of the matrix, right? So you go through all the possible pairs of the nodes and you calculate similarity. Now, obviously this matrix is symmetric and every node is of course self-similar. So similarity on the diagonal, there are ones for this matrix and that's sort of color coded as the strongest color here. Right there on the diagonal. But then you will notice that there are some groups of nodes that are very, um, you know, very, very similar. And uh, I believe this probably will be the nodes um, 33, 34 that are quite similar. Um, so um, that's how you build this, this type of matrix. Okay. Now that was sort of brute force, very simple, easy way to calculate similarity. Um, the other way, which is which is which become quite popular, is uh, also sort of similar to the way we define page rank. Now, if for example we have a you know any sort of directed or undirected graphs, we will call two vertices similar if they're connected to reference reference to by similar vertices. Right. So the idea is that you know two nodes, two vertices similar if the nodes that are pointing to them are similar. And uh, you know here it's defined for in neighbors clearly that if you have undirected graph it's just going to be neighbors. And the idea is somewhat like what we've done with the page rank, where we define uh, or 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 eigenvector centrality. Right, where we define similarity through itself, right? So two nodes are similar if um, the nodes pointing to them are similar, right? And then there is a sum of all the neighborhoods. Um, and of course, you take uh, you know nodes uh, self-similar. So then if we take this expression, put it into the matrix notation, we'll actually get this type of equation, right? So it is similarity pairwise similarity in between two nodes, and it's a matrix now, right? Instead of page rank, which was a vector, because page rank would give you one value per, per node. Here it's one value per pair of nodes. So it's a matrix. Um, it's written as a combination of, um, this is nodes i and j. So here we're getting uh, node K that points to node I, in node M that points to node J, and then similarity between those two nodes. So here's two nodes, we want to define similarity between them. So we're finding two other nodes that points here. And so similarity between these two guys, I express through the similarity between those. And then with sum over all, of course, all other nodes, that points to those guys and similarity among them. Now, we don't know any of those similarities except for this boundary condition that, or initial condition that similarity of the self-similarity of the node is, is one. Um, and then uh, we just solve this equation and uh, iteratively it can be solved and you can calculate similarities that way. It's called sim, sim rank or similarity rank. And I believe it's implemented in uh, Network X. Okay. Before we move forward, any questions about the similarity thing? Okay. Um, let's move on. So next, um, story I want to talk about is next topic is degree correlation. So degree correlation for two nodes um, is really is, is the likelihood that nodes tend to link to the nodes with similar or dissimilar node degree, right? So in some sense, it is like if we have a node of, of with 50 friends, it is more likely to link with a node of 50 or you know, 40 friends than with a node of one friend, with one friend, right? 
and the node with one friend, more likely to learn to the node with one friend than uh, to the hub. So um, the idea of this degree correlation, we can actually measure it uh, using, again, standard Pearson degree correlation coefficient, um, which is designed to work on a graph. And so, like with any other person correlation coefficient, you look for the deviation from mean, right? From average, ki minus k average, kj minus k average. But you measure it not for any pair, but only for those nodes that are connected, right? So literally what this says, we go through all the pairs of connected nodes and multiply um, their node degrees. And that will give us, um, correlation coefficient then because it is uh, centered, right? Because we subtract case. So if um, um, the correlation is positive, so which means uh, large, large nodes in terms of number of connections connect to the large nodes and small to the small, this correlation coefficient is positive. And if it's opposite, then it is negative. So that's like, so this is a metric for the entire graph. It's one number that you get from the graph. Now, you can actually go deeper and um, you can calculate degree correlation matrix, um, which is really the, just a fraction of edges connecting nodes with degrees K and um, K prime, right? So now it's a matrix. The size of the matrix is not the size of the graph, but the size of the, yeah, the this is a matrix um, where rows and columns are degrees of the nodes that are present in the graph. And there is as many um, rows and columns in this matrix as many node degrees exist in the graph, right? So you'll have uh, nodes with degree one, two, three, you know, 50, 75. Um, each of them will get its own uh, row or column on the matrix. And then what you do is for each you know, row and column, you just put how many um, of the edges that connects nodes of that degree and that degree exists in the graph. And then you normalize by the total number of edges. Now, we can also introduce what's called a degree correlation function. Now, a degree correlation function has the following um, definition. It is, um, um, it is k, k prime times this probability. Now, this is a conditional probability that if you have a node of degree k, it connects with a node of degree k prime. Now, if that's our conditional probability, then when we multiply on degree k prime, this is actually just an um, average node degree of a neighbors of a node with degree k, all right? So you take a node, so, so literally what you're calculating is you have a node with degree k, and then you calculate average node degree of its neighbors. And of course, this is calculated for all the nodes um, of degree k, however many you have it. And to calculate this degree correlation function, you just literally need to normalize the degree correlation matrix. So this is what it looks like. Um, what I'm trying to show on this slide are three different graphs um, with sort of different connectivity patterns. Now, if you notice um, on, on the left side, on the left graph, you will have um, a lot of chains where low degree nodes connecting to low degree nodes. And then here, the high degree nodes connecting to high degree nodes. Now, what you see here is this uh, correlation matrix where the darker, the stronger correlations. And um, so which means stronger correlations, which means you get more nodes um, of that degree connecting with the nodes of the same degree. And if you notice this and this is a connectivity in between nodes of high degree, this is a connectivity between nodes of low degree. So there are quite a few edges connecting low degrees among themselves and high degrees among themselves, right? And there's no connections of low degrees to high degrees. Now, on the right hand side, it's it's an opposite. Um, and notice that we almost don't have chains here, and quite often nodes of high degrees connected to the nodes of lower degrees. Right. 
And so that's, of course, is reflected on this degree correlation matrix. And you see that there is a connectivity of low degrees with high degrees, high degrees with low degrees. And then there is this sort of neutral type of a graph where um, things connected quite randomly. And so, you know, high degree nodes connected with low degree node another way around. So that's what this um, uh, correlation matrix look like. Now, if we look into this degree correlation function, uh, you can again, this is a function. So it is, um, let me come back for a sec here. This is a function I'm talking about. This is a function. So this is a function of K, right? So again, this is an average number of, um, this is average degree of uh, and, and uh, of nodes of a neighbor of degree K, right? Of node of degree K. So what this says then, if I go, oops, if I go here, back here, what it says is that, look, um, for example, in the graph of scientific collaborations, nodes with low degree, right, have on average, low degree neighbors. Nodes with high degree have high degree neighbors, right? Um, so this is, you know, very typical for the social network settings, where again, uh, you know, people who are more popular connecting with the people who are more popular, and um, other way around. So in some sense, it's more likely. Um, so this is scientific collaboration, right? So again, this is people who are, do not have a lot of collaborations, right? And so they are, the nodes they're connected to, the peers they're connected to don't have a lot of collaborations. And this is, you know, probably some established authors who have a lot of collaborations. And so their co-authors also quite established. Um, this is an example of power grid where you know it's quite neutral in the sense you know you 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 don't you don't see um anything here but for metabolic networks surprisingly it's actually other way around and um when you go for uh you know high degree nodes they're usually connected to low degree nodes right and so the neighborhoods are low uh, the neighborhood for high degree nodes have low degrees and that is just gives users kind of you know, star kind of uh, structure within the network. So based on that, um, there are usually people talk about two classes of networks. One is so-called assortative network or a network with positive degree of uh, positive correlation among the node degrees. Um, it's where hubs connected to hubs and low degree nodes connected to low degree nodes. And then there's a disassociative network where high degree nodes connected to low degree nodes and other way around. And on the left-hand side, we see this assortative network. And on the right-hand side, we, have, we see disassociative. So social networks typically are assortative networks. So, you know, people with a lot of friends connects to people with a lot of friends. That's what we, that's what we typically observe in a social network. Now, um, any questions on this? All right, let's move ahead. Um, exactly the same way as we just talked about correlation between node degrees. So we take two nodes and we look, um, we look at, the, um, at, at, at the correlation between two nodes you know, connected by an edge. We can the same way uh, look at any other properties of those nodes. So we can actually think um, about, you know, again, if it's social network, you know, age, gender, income, or you know, if it is metabolic network or any other network, we can think about any other property that is associated with a node. So now we're switching a little bit topics and we go from just structure a little bit to content. And so 
um, we can actually think about this assorted mixing as their uh, like links with like, right? So similar links with similar. So if the attributes on the two know when, when the uh, edge is formed, if the attributes of the two nodes are more similar for, the, for those that are connected or less similar for those that are connected, right? So like links with like, it's assorted mixing, like links with dislike is disassorted mixing, right? And for example, if you think about you know, income, it's usually people of similar income are friends. So it is you know, assertive mixing again. Um, and by the way, this kind of thing can, can, can allow us to predict certain properties of the nodes. But let's say dating network, if you look at the gender, most, most of the time is disassortative because it's opposite genders that date each other. Right, and so um, you get, you know, op different sort of different um, attributes on the uh, ends of the edges that are connected. Right. Um, political po political political stories they're quite popular in terms of, you know, finding this assertivity or disassertivity. And you know, there's this famous paper on political polarization on Twitter. It's who retweets who. And uh, you know, red color here are sort of right learning or you know, Republicans, blue color Democrats. And um, of course, you know, Democrats retweeting Democrats and Republicans retweeting Republicans, and they almost never overlap. So there is this, you know, so red connects to red, blue connects to blue. So it is very strong assertive mixing. Um, there is another word for it in sociology is called homophily. Okay, so um, we just sort of discussed uh, quanti qualitatively um, what that means, but let's look quantitatively how we can actually measure, for example, how can we measure this, uh, you know, assertive mixing, this, this difference. Well, the way to do this is for is for example by introducing um, so-called modularity metric. So the idea of this metric is the following: if if we had a graph with two types of nodes, right? Let's say red and blue, and they were completely randomly connected with no preference, then you would expect you would expect um, sort of correlation being zero, right? You would expect it's not assortative or not disassortative. It's just purely random. There is no preference, right? There will be the same sort of number of nodes of edges connecting the same color as the number of edges connecting different colors. So that's our baseline. And what we want to do is we want to compare the number of nodes connecting within the same class and the class here means, let's say, you know, color or the same label to uh, this random distribution. And the way to do it, you can actually show that if you have a random graph and uh, the way I, I just described randomly distributed connections, then it can be the expected um, connective connection between pairs uh, will be given by this product, KIKJ divided by 2M. But the real one is AIJ, right? It's the, the connection that we have. And so um, one can introduce this type of metric where here we have a sum. AIJ is an actual connectivity pattern. This term comes from this notion of baseline of comparing to um, what it would be if it was random. And um, this is a Kronecker delta, which just says, okay, if um, these classes are the same, it's one, and if classes are different, it is zero, right? And so then you can just calculate here uh, how often compared to a random graph, to random um, setup, how often um, your nodes of the same type are connected. And that tells you how sort of biased the system is, right? Um, and then one can actually just use that metric as a modularity, or there is also um, 
metrics, which is called assertivity coefficient, which is the ratio of this metric to the maximum possible value for that metric that is possible for a graph when it is completely, um, completely biased, right? Completely, uh, when, when one class connects completely to the same class and uh, another one to another one. So these are, this is sort of mixing. This is how you measure. This is how you measure um, the mixing uh, for um, the graph where you have categorical attributes. Now, if the attributes are scalar numbers and scalar number can be again, for example, you know, age or income or you know, sort of any, any other number, then it is easier. Then we just literally look again at the correlation the same way as we as we did when we tried to calculate um, when we tried to calculate uh, correlation for node degrees. But if it's not node degree, but if it is say age or or income, you know it's also it, you do it exactly the same way. You introduce this assertivity coefficient assertivity coefficient as the ratio of covariance toward variance. So it's the same Pearson correlation coefficient, right? Um, or you can simplify it the following way, but Xixj here stands for the values that are on the nodes and that the values are that are on the nodes. So again, the idea is you look at the nodes that are connected and just look at the values and those, oops, look at the values in those nodes, xi and xj, and the fact that we have here aij, that means they contribute to the sum only when they're connected, right? Without this aij matrix, they would always come contribute to the sum. But when we have this matrix, it's only when they're connected, they contribute to the sum. And of course, you know, since we sort of followed the same logic, if we replace xi, xj by actual node degree, right? We can easily do that. Um, then we'll get back to the formula we saw that 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 we started today with, and um, that's um, you know how you compute assertivity coefficient. And again, if you have a um, you know the, the simple matrix, then you know there is. A, Sort of quite efficient way of doing so. So you don't need to go through all those sums. Now, why, why would we bother at all doing this? Well, um, you know, there are some reasons um, you know, why it is important. Now let's look at these graphs. Um, this is a random graph um, generated uh, with uh, ergosh Rene model and you know, 10,000 nodes. And what we have on the left is this phase transition plot. And we actually looked at those plots before. It's, um, it, it is a plot that tells you that, okay, um, when, you reach, when you reach one, uh, average node degree one, you start getting this phase transition and you start getting this gigantic connected components, component within the graph. Well, uh, and that what corresponds to this, it's called here neutral, or it's called, it corresponds to the graph when there is no um, correlation between node degrees. Now, what's interesting, if we go for assortative mixing, and again, assortative mixing means um, low degree nodes connecting to low degree nodes and hubs connecting to hubs, right? High degree nodes to high degree nodes. You notice that, and, and by the way, this is of course, if you remember the size of gigantic connected components. So here is all the nodes uh, will be part of it. And here is, you know, 20% of the nodes are part of this gigantic component. So notice that it starts much earlier. It starts much earlier compared to what you would expect, you know, from, from um, pure, a random graph um, here, if you introduce into random graph um, this uh, correlation such that um, it's not just randomly connection, but high degree nodes connected to high degree and low degree, preferably to low degree, you start 
getting this gigantic component very, very quickly, right? But later on, it kind of slows down. It, it, it grows compared to disassociative. Now, disassociative starts later, but then goes very steep. So it kind of accumulates, accumulates, and then happens. Um, and, and the reason is some, somewhat obvious because, um, you know, again, when you have high degree nodes connecting, um, they form much bigger uh, conglomerate quicker because, again, you know, the, even in these settings, um, high degree nodes, they're high degree because they have more connections. Now, if we look at path length, right, remember we can calculate path lengths and uh, Again, this is a distribution, and of course, you know, for this for this graph, most of those path links are around here. Neutral, um, neutral, disassociative, assortative. It kind of shifts a little bit, sort of average path length, right? This is average path lengths. But what's interesting is um, are these tails, right? This is, um, you know, the the diameter of the graph, right? And notice that. Assortative gets much larger diameter, though it's the same type of random graph, but again, with slightly different correlations in the connection pattern than disassortative. And the reason here would be again for assortative network, remember, large nodes connect to large, low degree nodes connecting to low degree nodes. And when you have low degree nodes connecting to low de degree nodes, what you get is this, you know, those sort of chains, right? And those chains create for us um, very large diameter. So by looking at the correlations in, my, in, my, in between node degrees, um, you can actually tell a lot about um, the graph and you know, what kind of graph structure we expect. All right, finally, there is this sort of interesting you know, paradox Maybe paradox is a very strong word, but um, I would say curious observation. And I don't know if you ever heard about it or noticed it, um, but on average, on average, your friends are more popular than you are, which means on average, your friends have more friends than you do. One more time in plain English, you have K friends on average, when I add up all the fr all the number of friends of your friends, it will be larger than yours, than your K. Now, it sounds very strange, right? Um, so how is it possible that for everybody, um, you know, their friends are have more friends than the person? And, uh, you know, let's take a look at just a few numbers here. Um, as we discussed earlier in the lecture, average neighbor degree is given by this formula, right? It is just an average, um, this is, it's no degree times the probability, right? Now, if we have uncorrelated network, uncorrelated network, and I will give you an example here of uncorrelated network, and then that means um, a neutral network, that means you know the degree of one node does not depend on the degree on the of the node on the sort of other side of the edge, then this probability p k prime given k does not depend on k, right? Because the probability of a node having um, of, of of an edge connecting to a node of degree k prime does not depend on what it is also what it is what it is uh, else connected to. But then this probability we can easily calculate because if the probability of a, no, of, of a node in the graph to have degree k prime is given by you know, p times k prime, then the probability that an edge is leading to that node with degree k prime is equal k primes k prime times that probability. And the reason for that is simply because um, there are k, way, k prime ways to get to that node. Right, so there's p times k probability that the node um, has that degree, and there are k prime ways to get there. So, um, and then to normalize it, we just divide it by um, k average. So, this formula um, it actually just tells us 
the probability that at the end of a randomly selected edge, there will be a node of degree k prime. And that's what we have here, because again, um, it, it's independent scenario. Now, if you just take the sum, you realize it is equal to average k squared divided by average k. So what it says again, so if we have uncorrelated network or a network where the, where the uh, degrees of the neighbors are not correlated, then average no degree, uh, I'm sorry, average degree of a neighbor of a node with degree k is given by this. And uh, this is average for k and average for k squared. So it does not depend on the neighborhood, it depends overall on the graph. Now, uh, we have seen previously on the lecture on random networks that average of k squared when the random network is given by you know, k average one plus k average. So plug it in here and you will get this. Which actually says that uh, for a neighbor, the average node degree is equal k average in a graph plus one. So it actually tells you that uh, for any node, which really, you know, on average, um, the degrees of the neighbors will be at least one higher, the average degree of the neighbors, which is strange, but you know, th that's, that's a fact, right? And if we look at um, scale-free networks, um, in scale-free networks, so in, in, in random network, um, it's just k squared average k one plus k, so it's not that much. But in scale-free networks, um, it's actually true that this ratio is much, much greater than k itself. And so, you know, it can be several hundred. Um, and so then it means, you know, again, your friends are much more popular than you are. Now, I mean, the, the sort of the, the common sense explanation of this is that we are more likely to form friends with hubs than with small degree nodes. And again, that follows, you know, this logic, right? Whatever we do, um, it's much easier. It is much easier to run into a hub because there are so many ways to get to a hub than to a single node. Again, think about this, even if you're sort of meeting random people, um, it's much easier to meet a random person who has a lot of connections, or if you think about even, I don't know, running into somebody on a, on a Facebook by randomly following links. Again, it's a person who has a lot of friends, so who has a lot of ways towards him and who you most likely encounter if you do sort of random walking on, on, on this graph. And that's what this tells you. Um, so by the way you form the network, you tend to form the network with people who are actually have more kind of, you know, have high degrees of connectivity and so on average, yes, um, your friends will be more popular than you are. So now live with this. Um, any questions? All right, guys, you're very quiet today, but this is good because this is actually quite short lecture. I just wanted to focus today on this correlation patterns and this sort of, you know, friendship paradox. Uh, spend some time, think about it. And uh, with that, uh, we're done for today. All right. Thank you.